Hi, why don't we get started? So I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Philip Benoit, and I am an adjunct senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And I'm responsible for the Center's research initiative on the issue of energy for development. This evening, we are going to discuss energy challenges that are facing middle-income countries as they move from fighting poverty to promoting prosperity. I will introduce our panelists in just a moment. But first, let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live, and the full video will be available on Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy website in the coming days. And for those of you watching online, as well as people here in the audience, you can ask a question for the panelists at any time using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Now, middle income countries face a particular set of challenges. The struggle is often less about providing access where they have generally achieved significant success, but rather how to meet a growing appetite for advancement, notably within their expanding working and middle classes. The recent events in Chile help to illustrate the difficulties and pitfalls middle income countries face. And in fact, if you go back to our announcement, we had a picture of Santiago, Chile before the recent events. Energy is a big part of the equation. Energy directly touches everyone's life every day, at home, at school, and at their workplace. From electricity, through transport, through cooking and heating, energy is key to economic and social advancements. Tonight, we have a very distinguished panel of former ministers of energy to discuss this complicated but very important era, area. Ricardo Ranieri is the past president of the International Association for Energy Economics and is the former Chilean energy minister and chairman of the board of the Chilean state oil company, ENAP, as well as a former alternative executive director of the World Bank Group. He is a board member of Schrager Mining and Energy SA, and he is also a professor of the engineering school of the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And so we are pleased to have on this panel a minister from academia. Pedro Sanchez was the minister of energy of Peru from 2008 through 2011, when the country saw a remarkable period of growth. Pedro is currently lead energy specialist at the World Bank, where he deploys his knowledge as minister and as an overall international energy specialist to help developing countries around the world. He also has over 20 years of top management experience working in diverse organizations, including power utilities, private sector companies, and key government agencies. And so we are also pleased to have a development specialist who was minister on this panel. Again, for those watching online, my name is Philip Benoit, and I am here with Ricardo Ranieri, former Minister of Energy of Chile, and Pedro Sanchez, former Minister of Energy of Peru. We will start this event with two presentations, first by Pedro uh, and then by Ricardo, before turning it over to questions from the audience and from myself. Pedro? Uh, good evening to everybody. I will start this presentation thanking uh, Philip for inviting me to, uh, to be with you tonight to talk about the Peruvian case on this challenging issue, which is uh, 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 going to be uh, 
quite short because we want to more, I think the interesting piece will come with the questions. And basically before going to the presentation, I, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, uh, I am addressing this, uh, this PowerPoint. Starting with uh, Peru in the 90s, uh, 90, early 90s, Peru was in a very critical situation and was able to move to a quite uh, decent position today. And therefore, the challenges in the future are more complicated. So um, in addition, I will talk about the, the time I was minister, 2008, in which uh, we face a lot of interesting issues and the challenges uh, being uh, in the driving seat, uh, which is a very special experience. So this, uh, this is how uh, the Peru sees themselves, or oh, the Peruvians, uh, we see ourselves as uh, located in the center of the world. And uh, it is important, why? Because uh, one of the key elements of uh, developing the country has been the, uh, power, the trade itself. And by signing free trade agreements with uh, many countries, uh, more or less 90% of the GDP in those, in those countries are, uh, ac are uh, with access for the country. So we have uh, a quite uh, interesting number of uh, countries with uh, those uh, agreements. So this is um, how the economy look, uh, the Peruvian economy looks now. And uh, it's compared with Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. And in, almost in all of them, we are doing well in terms of public debt is one of the lowest in terms of uh, percentage of the GDP. International reserves is the highest. Uh, country risk is uh, the lowest. And inflation is one of the lowest, uh, definitely. So uh, this, uh, in general, I think the, the accounts are moving quite well. This, this information that uh, prepared by, uh, with uh, August numbers. And uh, as I was uh, telling at the beginning, uh, we are coming from a very tough situation. In 1990, inflation was 6,000% uh, per year. It's uh, hard to imagine how to live in an economy with 6,000% of inflation and coming to 2.2. So uh, in, in general, I think that was uh, one of the critical elements of the power of the sector reform. And the growth, the GDP in 90 was, uh, we were decreasing, min minus 5% or so. And in 2010, the time in which I was minister, uh, we, uh, we reached probably one of the highest uh, 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 speed of growth. Nowadays it's four and the forecast is going for uh, 3.5. The GNI per capita, it's, uh, it's amazing has increased 4.3 uh, times uh, from 90 to 2018. And poverty has been reduced for a significant amount to uh, less than 20% now. So those are the results of this uh, quite challenging uh, process of uh, reforms and persistence on applying uh, a serious uh, policies. In, in, in terms of the energy sector, uh, following more or less the same trend that the uh, GDP, the, the energy production has uh, multiplied by uh, four times, number of customers four times again, and natural gas has uh, increased substantially because uh, uh, starting in 2004, there was um, a national field of, uh, of resources which were discovered and put in, into the market. And the oil demand, because of that, kept, uh, didn't grow as fast as the other, other elements. When I uh, took the post in 2008, the country was facing a very real, uh, very difficult issue in terms of the supply. And the reason for that was basically that the, while the economy was growing between 2000 and 2007, 43% accumulated growth, and the power demand was growing almost 50%, the investment in terms of uh, power supply or energy supply was only 15%. As a result of that, we have a, a position in which the reserve were basically 5%, and any, uh, any issue with the system could uh, mean a uh, collapse. So uh, in terms of electricity, not enough uh, power supply. Uh, most of the energy was concentrated in the central part, and the north and the south, which were growing even faster, they, were ch uh, they had uh, power uh, supply challenges. 
so and the lines were not enough to, pro to provide the energy. And access, believe it or not, the access in 2008 was 74%. So that was, uh, we consider that uh, basically as a shame, how we could, uh, we couldn't afford to continue with that. So we uh, uh, decided to put in place a, a program to reverse that position. In natural gas, uh, um, despite the fact there was enough reserves, but the, uh, as the initial process of uh, gas was uh, uh, successful, the country engaged on an LNG project which committed basically 50% of the, of the installed capacity and, and most of the reserves. And because of, and, and the industry and was growing so fast in terms of gas, even uh, so uh, we came to a position in which uh, there was not enough gas for the supply. And transport capacity again was uh, overstretched. And it's, it is uh, very, very interesting because uh, when the uh, uh, gas supply started, we expected that by 20 years, the system was going to reach 450. No, uh, zero 450, I don't want to confuse the numbers. But by 2008, in only four years, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this capacity was, uh, was achieved. So uh, the growth was uh, significantly fast. In terms of the oil sector, uh, the situation was even more complex. The uh, two refineries with uh, all technologies, they were not able to process the, those dirty fuels. And as a result of that, the, <coughs> the country was facing, uh, had to import clean uh, fuels uh, to supply the, the system. So uh, th those were the challenges. And uh, obviously, we had to face all of them. In terms of uh, electricity, we, uh, we conducted a, a number of uh, operations in order to increase the capacity in the short term, uh, to build new uh, transmission lines. And uh, at that point, we started the, in 2010, we launched the first auction of renewable energy. Non-conventional, because the hydropower is one of the most uh, important uh, components of our supply. But on top of that, we decided to start the uh, 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 testing this new technology, wind and solar. In natural gas, uh, again, we did some kind of uh, activities to increase uh, exploration, uh, negotiating very hard with the consortium to, uh, to achieve increase on capacity and transfer facilities. In oil, we were less uh, successful because the, despite the fact that we had a lot of contracts, a lot of drilling, nothing happened. And we started the increasing of the, uh, and modernizing the refining capacity. And we put into the market uh, clean fuels and biofuels, for instance, we, which were mandatory uh, for both for diesel and for uh, <coughs> petrol. The results of this, uh, of this work, uh, of this three year, three year I was in, 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 uh, as minister, in terms of uh, generation expansion, uh, we achieved 48% of the installed capacity was increased with the investment commitments of $6.4 billion. In transmission, the total extension of lines was increased by 18%. Uh, the, the investment was uh, 0.85 uh, billion. And in access, in order to reach 92% from 74, we invested a lot of uh, half a billion dollars with a very innovative project, uh, process to reach the, 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 uh, those villages. Because the challenge in Peru is that uh, uh, we have uh, tiny villages, about 60,000 villages, which are located in the Andes and the Amazon. And each of them has only three households. So it's quite complex to reach them. Nowadays, obviously, it's much easier to do that using solar or any other technologies. But at that time, uh, still we did on-grid type of expansion, which was a challenge. In terms of oil, uh, we did the same. The reserve amount was increased by 27%. The transport capacity was expanded almost by 40%, and distribution 75 This is uh, the, uh, the most interesting part, because uh, uh, most of the vehicles move to natural gas, compressed natural gas, and so the expansion was significant. At the same, uh, this time, also, we started to discuss the long term, something we are discussing, we are going to respond today, which is the long term actions. And still, I think the challenges are the same. 
how to guarantee the energy supply, how to extend, extend energy access, which is almost done now because today the access rate in Peru is 94, 96%. And uh, uh, how to develop the, and use the renewable sources uh, because in Peru has a potential uh, which is more or less 10, 10 times the installed capacity can be supplied with uh, uh, hydropower potential. We could do hydro, but uh, we also have some solar or wind power which could be used, and that's the, uh, the trend. In particular, all those renewable, uh, in the future, what I envisage is that those renewables will be used, uh, and the natural gas which is uh, abandoned in the country will be uh, the backup to uh, guarantee all this uh, supply. Uh, the challenges for the future are quite amazing. I, uh, I took these numbers from the various studies. And obviously, facing or looking forward 2050, the economy will be, again, to grow two or three times. And by doing so, the, uh, the investment which is required to to meet those targets of growth uh, are going to be quite challenging. The uh, solar will be uh, will move to 20, 30 percent. The natural gas capacity will be almost uh, will grow almost four times. The energy, uh, uh, oh sorry, the CO2 emission will be more or less uh, same, keeping the same. And power uh, electrical vehicles and, mm, uh, are going to take uh, it, uh, probably a more significant role. And uh, to, uh, to look forward, I, I took this, uh, this uh, slide from the World uh, Energy Council, uh, uh, which was uh, to me, uh, from all these eight elements, the most important, uh, which I would like to highlight is this. Uh, evolution of international governance and geo geopolitical change. This document was prepared uh, in 2017, and I think in some regards, this is going to be the area in which the, mo the challenges are going to be for most of the countries. What's going on in Chile, in general, in Latin America, I think, and in the world, uh, are uh, part of this agenda. How is the governance and geopolitical uh, uh, issues going to, uh, to be uh, dealt with? To, uh, to finalize my presentation, uh, probably it's uh, something that uh, Philip uh, asked us to talk about a bit of how do, how is the, from the personal perspective, how a minister will face on all those issues. So there's uh, basically the political environment, which in Latin America is quite complex. We're discussing you know, with Ricardo, and what we know is that the opposition parties they're not trying to discuss, to come to agreements. They're basically in a very tough position, trying to uh, always oppose to anything. So my, I used to spend my time as minister going to the Congress to, the, uh, to discuss with the various committees, to explain almost everything. It took a, a big uh, amount of my time in this process of negotiating and explaining. Uh, but uh, that's the only way to deal with that. Sometimes it's not enough, but uh, it's the one way. The other thing, the constituencies. In most of the uh, energy resources and mining resources are located in areas which are part of the communities. And the communities, uh, by 2010, they start to have a very, very important role. Because there's the an, an, uh, resolution of the ILO, which gives them the, the right of uh, having a say to be consulted for any single decision that the government has to make. This process is quite uh, complex. It takes uh, various uh, phases in which the community needs to agree on, uh, on what the benefits, or how this project could affect them or so. And it is uh, quite challenging. Most of the riots will come from this uh, process. Media, media. Uh, if you think that media in the U.S. is complicated, uh, uh, in our countries it is even more complex, because you never know that uh, how what kind of interest could be moving around. But uh, it's quite active. And finally, I put management, but in fact, it is the the public sector setup. 
in, uh, because of these uh, challenges of corruption or so, most of the regulations are quite uh, heavy in order to provide controls. And by doing so, the whole process becomes quite uh, complicated to deal with. So as a result of that, uh, public uh, official, um, a minister or any, anyone in the government, in order to make any decision and in order to implement any policy, it's not good enough to make it very clearly. And on top of that, you have to take care of what the implications could be from the political side, from the social side, what, uh, or even from the, uh, what kind of uh, interest could be around. So, uh, and because of that, uh, the decision-making process is quite complex, quite challenging. So in, but still, I think uh, uh, for people, uh, it is good to, to participate on the government. Because if, for instance, even in my case, even today, uh, this year, I get some calls from the parliament, from the judicial system, to testify about decisions I made in 2010, 2011. And people ask me about that. Uh, was it worthwhile to be minister to serve your country under those uh, difficult conditions? And, and my answer very, is uh, quite simple. Because of my action during that time, I, pu I provided electricity service to three million people, the poorest of the country. So, and the point is, that, that fact of uh, that having, having that, achieved that, uh, that result, to me, it's uh, uh, replaced any, any minor thing to be of bothering about the, the governmental issues. And I think the uh, still people in, uh, in most of the countries, they need to participate to, to make some commitments for the country, uh, for our countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro, for that very interesting presentation that I think on the one hand gave us a sense as to what uh, is going on in Peru, what it looks like economically and from an energy perspective, as well as those uh, very useful and uh, insightful comments in terms of what it's like to be uh, a minister. I will say, uh, as you all know, the Center on Global Energy Policy is associated with Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and clearly to sort of hear that public service does make sense and you think it's still worthwhile, I think is an important message. Uh, so now we're gonna actually turn to Chile, which, and I think something that's important to recognize is notwithstanding all the gains that uh, Pedro described in terms of, uh, in Peru over the last 30 years, Chile really is, is a country that is uh, significantly wealthier. And so uh, looking forward to Ricardo's discussion of some of the opportunities and challenges that Chile faces. Well, thank you, Philippe, for the invitation of uh, speaking here at uh, Columbia University at SIPA. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I think it's uh, late. Uh, you are tired for the the whole day. So I, I really appreciate that uh, you make the space to come here. Uh, I will make a short presentation, but certainly uh, the questions that uh, you will uh, come up will be much more interesting gi given the, what's going on in Chile. Uh, Philippe, uh, show a nice picture of the city of Santiago. Uh, he says sa this is before uh, the riots. Well, the city is still there. Uh, the picture is still there. It's the, it's the same. Uh, uh, haven't changed too much. Uh, uh, there are some damage in the city in some particular areas, uh, but uh, uh, things uh, are not easy, uh, but certainly communication, the media, uh, sometimes uh, exacerbate what's going on in the country. Uh, uh, so let's go to my presentation. It uh, was complex to decide on what I will talk today. Uh, uh, Philippe invited me to talk about moving beyond poverty to prosperity and energy challenges for middle-income countries. Uh, and I will recognize that I say yes, uh, that's a very interesting subject, uh, uh, but uh, I made a little twist uh, to the focus of the presentation to the first part of the title, 
to some extent. So moving beyond poverty to prosperity, uh, where energy is part of that equation. Mm. Uh, uh, what's going on in Chile certainly has me very worried. Uh, I'm really concerned uh, how the government will come to an agreement uh, with the position and they will uh, calm things down. Uh, what is going on in Chile is not only important for Chile, it's also important uh, for the whole region, uh, uh, for what happened with democracy in the region. So there are many issues that are uh, mixed in, in uh, the situation that's happening right now uh, in Chile. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the most pressing priorities in the developing world, well, uh, here I have some articles I have published in the main Chilean newspaper, El Mercurio, uh, regarding challenges in Chile, but also challenges that replicate in many other par parts of the world. These are in Spanish, so sorry if you cannot read them, uh, uh, but I can give you the, the, the titles. Uh, the one, uh, we have the one that is, this works or no, no. Uh, no, it doesn't work there, okay. The one that is in the middle, in the middle it says uh, how we can escape from the middle income trap, uh, uh, a subject that is in the center of uh, going from uh, poverty to prosperity. Uh, uh, the uh, one on the, on the left hand side uh, is uh, talk about the challenges to uh, consumer protection and uh, the promotion of competition in developing countries. Uh, the one in the right uh, in, uh, is uh, the need to integrate the Chilean economy, a small country with 18 million people uh, to the world economy, to integrate the country with uh, global value changes and open markets. And on the top we have a uh, uh, let's be disruptive is we want to become a developed country and that talks about the challenge to uh, move from an economy that grows uh, using uh, labor and capital accumulation uh, to an economy where knowledge, uh, innovation are the third engine of economic growth that is key if you want to become a developed nation. Uh, uh, then we, ha we have one that talk about the need for a proper business environment. Uh, uh, and that is key if you want to attract foreign investment and also if you want to have nation, uh, the nationals uh, to invest in your own country. Also, we have one that talk about uh, for Chile to become a developed nation, uh, we need growth. Uh, uh, you cannot move forward, uh, uh, increase uh, living condition of the people if there is no economic growth. So that talks about uh, the need for economic growth. And certainly uh, on the, the one on the top, on the right hand side, is about uh, energy security, how the US has made to increase global energy security, and how that uh, comes down to policies in developing countries regarding the issue of uh, energy security. So uh, what are the pr most pressing priorities in the developing world? Uh, certainly we see uh, uh, that is uh, the issue of poverty, uh, a, a big challenge in terms of reducing poverty levels in developing countries. Uh, the good news is if we look to the world economy, uh, we have uh, been able to decrease uh, poverty from 1990 to uh, today uh, from 1.9 billion people about 36% of, of the population to uh, less than uh, a billion to 730 million, about 10% of the population. So as a, the world is much better today in terms of the reduction of poverty uh, as it was uh, in 1919, uh, basically three decades ago. Huh? Also, uh, in terms of en the energy side, uh, there has been huge improvements in the reduction of uh, uh, the lack of access to energy. Uh, uh, and today we have about a little bit more than one billion people without energy access. Most of that people is in Africa uh, and some region of Asia. Uh, Latin America is doing quite well there. We still have some black uh, spots, but certainly Latin America is mo have moved uh, very well. In the case of Chile, for example, we have about 20,000 families uh, without 
energy access, uh, electricity access. And, and the challenge there is how you reach those families that are in very remote areas so you cannot extend the grid to those houses. So you have to figure out what kind of energy we can bring to these people that uh, lacks electricity in, uh, in, in Chile. Uh, uh, also, in the world economy, we, we see a huge uh, uh, to-do list, I would say, regarding access to clean cooking facilities, where about 2.8 billion people sti still lack access to clean cooking facilities. So energy, as part of this equation, is an important issue, starting uh, from those that are worst, without access to electricity, uh, also without access to uh, clean cooking energy uh, facilities. So there are uh, some important challenges in the energy sector. Uh, uh, also, in terms of uh, challenges for the world economy, economic development, uh, uh, there is uh, the challenge of job creation. Uh, if, if we think areas uh, like Africa, we have about 65% of the population is under the age of uh, 25. Uh, and uh, that is a big challenge, how in the years to come, we are going to create jobs uh, in a very complex region for all these uh, young people that has aspiration, they, they, they see TV, uh, and they want certainly to have a better life. So frustration and the chances of having uh, social unrest are very high. So there is a big challenge in terms of uh, job creation in many regions, particularly in the case of Africa, uh, where uh, we have uh, very poor uh, conditions. Mm. Improving living condition, the good news is that when we look Latin America, uh, uh, living conditions have improved uh, uh, in the last decade and, and this decade. Uh, we have the poverty rate uh, as measured by the World Bank for, uh, for Latin America has decreased significantly in, in, in the whole region. Uh, in the case of Chile, uh, you will see that the poverty rate today is uh, about 10%. Uh, uh, from 30% in year 2000, so a, a large decrease in the poverty rate. Mm. Uh, and the challenge that may uh, be part of this social unrest that we see in the region is the high level of uh, inequality that still persists in many Latin American countries. Uh, uh, you have that the Gini coefficient uh, uh, for the, the southern corn uh, in general is 0.44 for Chile today is about uh, 0.47, uh, uh, but so and that numbers uh, show a big level of inequality. If you go to the most developed countries, countries with a higher uh, human development index, uh, like the Nordic countries. European countries, uh, developed countries in general, the Gini coefficient in, is around 0 0.3. Uh, uh, a little bit more point than 0 0.3, or a little bit less than 0.3 is better, uh, uh, but that's the number where you see uh, the level of income inequality. In Latin America, we have higher level of income inequality. The good news is that it's coming down, uh, but it appears it hasn't come down fast enough uh, as the people is expecting to have a much better uh, life. Mm. So uh, there is a big challenge. Uh, in terms of uh, income distribution, a different picture of that inequality. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the income distribution in Latin America and the Caribbean, where in Latin America, in general, you have that 24% of the population is poor. 37% is vulnerable, 36% is middle class, and 3% is high income or uh, rich people. In the case of Chile, uh, you have that 6% of the population is poor, according to this measure. 33% uh, is vulnerable, 56% is the middle class, so a large middle class according to World Bank numbers, and 5% uh, is of high income and uh, rich people. So uh, the region, Chile, are doing much, much better with an increasing percentage of the population that belongs to the middle class. 
Uh, uh, some years ago, uh, we celebrated, at uh, that time I was in the World Bank, and we were celebrating that uh, for the first time uh, in Latin America, uh, the people that belongs to the middle class was uh, larger than the people that was poor as a percentage. Uh, and that was very good news. So uh, in general, you used to have that the percentage of poor people was the majority. And uh, now we have that the percentage of people that belongs to the middle class uh, is the majority. And that certainly creates different challenges. The people will have different expectations regarding uh, what they expect from uh, the government. Uh, other important challenge that we see in uh, developing countries is uh, the challenge of uh, productivity. Huh? If you are, in general, in low-income countries, uh, uh, the challenge of productivity is, to some extent, a little bit easier than the challenge of productivity, productivity in middle-income, high-income uh, countries. In low-income countries, in general, you get a lot of uh, increased improvements in productivity by reallocating uh, resources uh, from areas where they are very unproductive to areas where they are much more uh, productive. Okay, so so that is a little bit much easier. So low-income countries, in general, you can improve your productivity with what, what we call long-hanging fruit. But if, when you move to uh, middle to high-income countries, uh, the challenge of productivity is much, much complex, uh, and you have to reach high-hanging hang fruit, and uh, you will not get uh, much productivity reallocating resources from areas that are very unproductive to areas that are much more productive because you already did that. Uh, so how you can improve your productivity? And there is where it comes the issue of uh, starting this third engine of economic growth, that is uh, innovation, technology development, uh, uh, the, the economy of knowledge. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge, I would say, that is facing many uh, countries uh, in Latin America, particularly in the case of Chile, where you have that the investment in research and development is 0.36% uh, is of GDP uh, compared to uh, other countries that has uh, more than 2% of GDP. The case of the U.S. is about 2.3, 2.4, I think. Uh, you have the case of Israel. Uh, Korea that invests, I think, uh, more than 4% of GDP in research and development. So uh, with 0.36% of GDP uh, w for an economy that is small, with a, a per capita income that is small, because it's not the $30,000, $40,000 that you will find in, in rich countries, uh, in the case of Chile, per capita income in, in dollar, in current dollars, is about sixteen, seventeen thousand uh, dollars So when you have this 3.36% of GDP of investment in R&D is a small amount of money. So, so for you to get an idea, uh, Chile invests 36% of GDP in R&D, in research and development. Most of that investment is made by the government, two-thirds. Only one-third is made by companies. If you come to the U.S., the figures is the other side. Two-thirds of the investment in R&D is made by companies, and one-third is made by the government. Okay? And when you think about those 0.36% of investment in R&D, we are talking about $1 billion, a little bit more than one billion dollar of investment in R&D in the whole Chile. How much invest Columbia University in R&D? Penn University. Uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, I think, is one of the that invests the most. Uh, is 1.6 billion, maybe. Uh, uh, so you have in the whole country, we are investing less than one university, one leading university in the U.S. And that is a big challenge. It's a big challenge. Uh, I, ha I have my daughter that's at the University of Northwestern, and she always send me emails. Look, we are doing all this investment in R&D. And I say, oh my god. <laughs> huh? yeah. They invest almost the same as uh, we do in Chile. So, so the challenge of productivity is a big one. How we change our economy, how we change the mind of people, of, in, of entrepreneurs, uh, how we create 
um, a business environment that is attractive to invest in R&D that pro produce new products, services, and so on. So there is a big challenge. And also, uh, if you look at these developing economies, many of them rely heavily on extractive industry and also on natural resources. Uh, and when you have these economies with, uh, that are not very developed, that rely on a lot of extractive industries, uh, natural resources, there is a big issue regarding the uh, use of uh, the rents that come from these extractive industries. Uh, the country that made very well that, uh, that issue is uh, the case of Norway. Uh, they created this uh, oil fund where they have about a trillion dollar of investment for a country of 4.5 million people. Uh, in Chile we have a lot of copper, but our wealth fund uh, is about uh, 13 billion dollars. It's very small compared to what it should be. Uh, it's very small with what it should be. In general, uh, uh, rents from extractive industries are captured by different interest groups. So at the end, you, uh, if you talk about in, Ch in Chile, if you say, well, the copper is the salary of Chile, most of the Chilean guys will look at you and say, what salary? I don't get nothing for that. Huh? Uh, even though uh, copper, uh, rents on copper uh, provide about 6% of the government budget. Huh? But in general, uh, there is a big challenge on uh, the rents of the extractive industry of natural resources, how they are managed, okay, and how uh, they are put on the service of the people. Huh? Uh, other challenge we have in developing countries is the, uh, the growing social and environmental constraints huh, and concerns. Certainly, so we, we are facing uh, big challenges in terms of the development of uh, many investment projects. Uh, if you are planning to trying to build a power plant, a large power plant, uh, or you want to build a, a port, uh, you will say face in general uh, strong opposition from uh, environmental groups, from from local communities. Uh, that they, they they say, well, you are getting building this. What do we get from that? Uh, uh, is this going to make our life much better? Or, or you will just ins ha install this facility here and we will get nothing from there. Okay, so, so there is a big challenge how we deal with the civil society. Uh, certainly, part of the democracy is to hear very well to them, uh, uh, but we have to make the balance in terms of uh, putting forward development that will benefit them and at the same time taking care of uh, environmental concerns, uh, social uh, demands. Uh, so. Uh, there is a nice book by uh, a Venezuelan former minister uh, that is called The End of Power, uh, and he, uh, Moises Naim, mm? and he wrote that book back in 2013, uh, and he put uh, some ideas of how has, has changed power in the last decades uh, in the world. And uh, well, in terms of civil society, he says we are more and more educated and, and more empowered. And that is a big challenge for the government, as we have seen uh, around the world, uh, certainly today for Chile, uh, uh, how the governments can manage uh, these more empowered people uh, that is uh, going around with many demands. Uh, uh, corruption, sabotage, and crime is another big challenge for uh, developing countries uh, is a big one. Is a big one. Uh, it's hard to com to to confront that uh, because uh, corruption is something that is very quiet and it, it gets in the network of this whole society. Huh? Uh, so democracies uh, should find ways. Huh? To, to fight corruption, to find ways uh, to, to, to work against that. Uh, and uh, in Chile, uh, we used to think that we have very, very, very low corruption levels. But a couple of years ago, we, get, we wake up in a nightmare see, seeing that there was a lot of corruption, much more beyond that what we expected. 
Uh, uh, and that was a big shock for all the society in Chile. Uh, and that is part of the unrest that you see here today. Uh, because people say, well, you are asking me to do, uh, to spend less, uh, to work hard, but at the same time I am, see, I am seeing a lot of people that is in the government or uh, in the political parties or doing business in a very improper way. Uh, uh, so uh, you have to solve that. Uh, and in general, the corruption cases that we saw in Chile uh, the results were not very satisfactory in terms of the, uh, what the citizen in the street expected. Uh, uh, there was a case of uh, entrepreneurs that uh, were financing in an illegal way politics and uh, uh, they were given uh, ethic classes. So people say, oh my God. <laughs> so uh, instead of uh, having uh, to pay a high price for corrupting the political system, uh, they, they receive ethical. So, so th that was a, a big challenge. Also, uh, we have seen in Latin America a huge challenge in terms of corruption. Uh, there is a, a movie in Netflix and a book that's called The Mechanism, uh, and, and that deals about uh, the Lavallato case in Brazil. Hmm? Uh, uh, and later on, we, uh, we hear about the OAS or the bridge case, uh, how uh, big construction companies have uh, corrupt uh, the political system in whole Latin America. Uh, so that is a big challenge for uh, developing countries. Uh, uh, nobody is immune to corruption. So that is something that we have to work very carefully. Uh, sabotage. Is another big issue. Uh, what you see here in those pictures is what they call cats. Uh, it's people in Brazilian uh, areas where they go up to the electricity network to connect their houses uh, to the grid uh, without paying electricity. Uh, and uh, at the end, you have the problem that there are areas where big collection revenues for the company to provide electricity in those village, villages is zero. They don't get anything. And the workers of the electric utilities can't go in to repair the grid that it keeps running, but they, don't, they are not paid. Nothing for that. Uh, and if they want to install meters uh, to, to, to start uh, billing the, the use of electricity, uh, they kill them. Uh, uh, and the company says to the government, well, you have to solve me this problem. And the government said to the company, you have to provide electricity. And nobody wants to put their hands in finding a solution to this big issue of uh, what we call non-technical energy losses. Huh? Because the technical ones are the technical energy losses. Well, we have this other non-technical energy losses. Okay, so that is another uh, big challenge. Uh, energy transformation and energy security. Well, uh, regarding Chile, uh, uh, regarding Chile, well, well, the world economy in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years is going on the, a deep transformation of the energy sector, of the electricity sector, uh, where most of this transformation comes from uh, really amazing uh, technological changes. Uh, in the case of, uh, for example, oil gas production, uh, we have that the U.S. in about in less than a decade became the the major oil producer in the world because of the shale uh, oil revolution, uh, a technology that was developed uh, by uh, Americans uh, in, I understand, uh, in the by the. National Energy Labs of the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, so. That technology allowed a country that was facing increasing problems in its oil supplies, allow it to become today one of the biggest oil producers in the world, and is exporting uh, oil and gas uh, to other countries. Uh, to Chile today is buying natural gas from the US. Mm. Uh, other important breakthrough in this uh, energy revolution it came from uh, solar plants, solar power, uh, different kind of solar power, wind plants, uh, technologies that have matured and at the same time their cost has 
come down uh, to very competitive uh, levels where today are more cheaper in some parts than uh, traditional uh, energy sources. In the case of Chile, for example, uh, most of what is under construction today is uh, solar power plants or wind farms. Uh, uh, traditional energy sources for electricity in general are today much more expensive than uh, these uh, renewable energy sources. And in that extent, given also the huge solar radiation that Chile has in the north, uh, uh, has created Chile as one of the, what they call the Saudi Arabia of, of the sun for uh, renewable energy. So that is a, a big uh, issue. So in terms of uh, in a final con comments, uh, uh, what are the challenges for the energy sector in Chile? Well, I would say to build an economy and an energy mix which will face increasing restrictions on CO2 emissions and certainly on polluting energy sources. Uh, what we see is that the civil society will tax the sector with new constraints. Okay, so you have to think very well what kind of energy sources you want to build. Uh, there is an imperative to transport the energy mix in many cities that face severe air pollution problems, uh, particularly in the south of the country where heating in general is done with uh, good, uh, burned in very old ways, so combustion uh, is very bad and pollution inside the houses, outside the houses is terrible. Uh, we have the challenge to arrive with energy services to those city citizens that are in remote areas. I talk about 20,000 uh, families. And the, the challenge to en ensure affordable energy and energy security, security with a more integrated global economy where we will see an intense competition for the control of energy sources and exposed to price manipulation and geopolitical and local risks. And finally, the challenge to att attract investment into the energy sector with affordable prices avoiding energy subsidies. Okay, so that's what I have prepared to, to talk for today talks. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Ricardo, for that. I mean, I was very much struck that in both of your presentations, you spoke a lot about climate change uh, and the climate constraints. I will note that the last COP to be held in Latin America was held in Peru. Uh, and the next COP that was supposed to be held in Latin America was supposed to be held uh, in Chile. I won't actually ask about climate change, but maybe somebody from the audience <laughs> will. Um, let me just say, we are discussing the energy challenges facing middle-income countries in their efforts to continue growth and to meet the expectations and aspirations of their populations. I apologize for the uh, technical issues we had at the beginning that obviously have delayed us a little. Uh, but we will now have a conversation amongst the panelists and then open it up to questions from the audience in a bit. From those here in person, for those here in person, when we turn to the audience for questions, please raise your hand if you have a question and we'll bring a microphone to you. For those watching online, again, you can use the hashtag CGEP, C-G-E-P events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy to ask a question. So I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative to launch us on this. You know, in some ways, I was very much struck listening to what you were talking about, Ricardo, in terms of a potential irony. You, you, you mentioned that, in fact, we've seen significant growth in the middle class in Chile, and that's obviously something we've seen in Peru. Uh, we've seen reductions in inequality, maybe high, but things are getting better in that regard. And yet, at the same time, we sort of are seeing a lot of civil and political unrest in Chile, in Peru, in so many other countries. So when we think about, I guess the question is, is there really a middle income trap? And is that trap maybe manifesting itself more in political, civil unrest uh, ways than we had anticipated? Maybe Ricardo, if you want to start, and then Pedro. Well, yes. Uh, do you hear? Yeah. We have that middle income trap. Uh, we have that the last decade a little bit, well, for one decade, a little bit more maybe, for one decade, uh, Latin America has very uh, success grow, a very good improvement on the living condition of the people. Uh, and that was fueled 
mainly by what we call this natural resource uh, boom price. Huh? Uh, the huge demand from China in the early 2000s uh, was very good for the region in terms of providing the region with uh, additional resources that allowed most of the countries to improve the living conditions of the population. Uh, once China uh, started to grow less and in recent years with this uh, uh, trade war between China and the U.S., certainly uh, the demand for uh, natural resources uh, has sl slowed down. Uh, we saw, for example, if we go back to 2014, uh, how it collapsed the oil price. Uh, in 2014, we were with an oil price of about $100 per barrel. In uh, one year, it went down very, very sharply. Uh, and at the same time, the prices of other uh, natural resources. So the people in Latin America, I, I would say, was getting used to this high growth rate uh, with uh, additional resources that are uh, improving their, their living conditions every year. And the governments in the recent years have faced a, a situation that has been very complex, that these uh, extra rents that come from natural resources are not available. Uh, uh, we can think the case of the government of Argentina, uh, Mauricio Macri. Uh, uh, he was elected about four or five years ago uh, uh, with large expectations to improve the, the living condition of the people. Uh, he made a bid to an improvement in the price of their exports, uh, uh, improvement that never came. Uh, and that put him in a very complex situation in terms of uh, the expansion of uh, a government expansion, expansion uh, national debt, and so on. Uh, the, the government of President Piñera also has a slogan for his campaign, uh, uh, better times, uh, uh, the, uh, the arrival of better times with, uh, with him. Uh, he got into the government, uh, economic growth was good, uh, but not as good as people expected. Uh, Chile last year has a good uh, growth rate, uh, about 3%. Uh, this year be, we expect to be between 2 to 3%. Uh, that's not bad. Uh, but certainly for developing countries like Chile, uh, Peru, and other regional countries, we need much, much bigger growth rate if we want to keep uh, to uh, answer to the expectations of the population of this middle class that has become used to a higher level of income. Okay, thank you. Pedro? Uh, the only thing I would add to whatever Ricardo has said is uh, how the, it's not bad for the countries to use the natural resources to, to grow. No, that's not bad. Uh, the, I think which is bad is not doing anything else. But in terms of, uh, so what me, it means is to, uh, the economy needs to diversify. And in case of the industry, for instance, uh, or the non-traditional export in Peru, the, uh, because of the mining industry, it developed uh, very uh, substantially. So these uh, services, uh, which initially were set up just to serve the mining industry, now they're exporting. So there's a metal mechanic type of products. It's one line. And the other one is the uh, agrobusiness. Agrobusiness has increased substantially in Peru. So it's some, still on this, uh, on this process, and, but it, uh, we still need further uh, diversify, uh, diversifying our uh, export or whatever in order to make all this growth sustainable in the long term. So, uh, just a follow-up question: um, What about the issue of uh, civil unrest, political unrest? How, how do, you, do you see any connection there? What's the experience in Peru? Uh, by 2010, uh, 2011, that that, uh, that uh, period or that term of the government was absolutely successful. We used to go around saying that uh, we are the new tigers of, uh, of Latin America, or so. And uh, probably the way in which this has been translated is the fact that uh, we expected that the next uh, uh, term was going to be more or less follow the same trend. And suddenly what happened was the people were not happy with it. And they decided to vote for a government which was uh, more in the different, with a different policies. 
And because of that, the uh, economy was, uh, the rate of uh, growth decreased for a while, but uh, probably those are the, uh, the elements that uh, explain this, uh, the political uh, uh, impact on the economic growth. Sometimes we are doing well, but uh, it creates an expectation, slow down, again, we will have to start again. So the, instead of going straight to the, to the uh, to development, we have to do all those bouncing processes, which is normal, and it's created basically by expectations of people. Right, thanks. So um, opening up for questions from the audience, if you could sort of raise your hand, and then if you could just introduce yourself as well. So if we could start with the, uh, over here on the aisle. Yeah, if you could just stand up, please. And present yourself and just ask a, if you could ask a brief question rather than any comments. Oh, okay, hi, uh, I'm Eduarda. I'm a first year student here at SIPA, studying energy and environment. And my question is for Pedro Sanchez. Uh, you mentioned the increase in energy access in your country when you were the minister. And I was just very interested in learning more if you could provide uh, uh, policy examples of how you achieved this increase. Uh, because being a Brazilian, I know how hard it is to get to, uh, to the Amazon. So how did you do this in terms of policy and infrastructure? Pedro? Uh, in, uh, uh, the power sector in Peru was privatized in the 90s, 1990s. Uh, 95. So the most of the um, services provided by public, by private uh, companies. That, uh, there is no uh, government subsidy, so um, all the system is basically cost recovery tariff for sure. And but in uh, the distribution company, they don't have the mandate. They don't have the obligation to serve everybody under certain area. So what we did at that time was basically to as policy was to uh, subsidize the uh, investment to, to expand the grid. So uh, by doing so, we were able to achieve, uh, as I mentioned, 92%. So in addition, the, the other piece, uh, which, which I am applying in Africa now, is to, instead of going by, uh, by tiny expansions, we did something, uh, massive packages. During that period, we uh, basically implemented uh, 13 packages of about uh, $100 million or so, uh, 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 sorry, solace, which is about uh, this $500 million which uh, was expanded. So that was in the expanding the, the areas. And in addition, we did something in the, with the solar, but the solar was not so good at the time because you have to change the equipment every two years. So, but now, I think there's all the opportunity to, uh, to complete the expansion by doing those, uh, those resources because now the, uh, the battery will be there for 10 years. So in, uh, there was a, an additional thing, uh, which was uh, basically we applied the uh, output-based uh, aid for the areas within the concession areas uh, served by the, by the private companies just offering some kind of uh, payment, once, uh, one uh, time payment to the companies uh, who could uh, connect uh, customers. And by doing the we connected something like 200,000 households. So by doing all these elements, we were able to increase the access to the rate I mentioned before. If I could just add, to, I, actually at the time I was the uh, energy sector manager at the World Bank responsible for Latin America. Uh, and actually Peru was one of the few countries that actually relied heavily on the private sector in partnership with the public sector. Uh, to expand access. Now, having said that, most successful access programs are done by the public sector. But what was going on in Peru was actually a very interesting sort of public-private partnership. Um, any other questions? Over there, in the back. Hi, my name is Leo. I'm a second year at CIRTSIPA, also studying energy and environment. First of all, thank you very much uh, to both ex-ministers for coming. Um, you alluded to the great successes that you've had in promoting energy access as well as re reducing poverty uh, in both of your countries. And it is a great success, I have to admit. But what I'm wondering is, when you were designing these energy access policies or just improving your en en uh, energy situation, how did you c account for the potential of climate change to undo a lot of the advances that you would make, especially uh, in light now of how, how climate change is becoming worse and worse 
and especially how uh, major population centers in Peru and Chile are next to the coast, which are threatened by rising sea levels. Thank you. Maybe Ricardo, if you want to start. Yeah. <clears throat> no, for energy access policy, you always have to set targets. Uh -huh. First, you have to identify the problem. Uh -huh. Where is the people that doesn't have electricity? Uh, you need to the information, uh, and then you have to set targets, ambitious targets uh, that the government has to plan and fulfill. That can be done by the government or can be done by the private sector, uh, as was done in general in Peru and also in the case of Chile. Uh, uh, once you have th those targets, and if you want to go ahead with the private sector, uh, uh, you have to provide in general subsidies because you are going to areas where privately is not profitable. Uh, uh, and the way that you extend the grid is you ask, for example, uh, I want to go to 10 kilometers from here, uh, uh, who is able to build that uh, transmission line, that grid, for the smallest subsidy. Uh, so, so that was the way how it was worked in Chile the extension of the grid as much as we can. Uh, and always we did a, a social assessment evaluation of cost benefits. Uh, uh, once you reach a point where you cannot extend the grid, uh, you have to look for a uh, tailored solution for that particular area. And if you are in the north of the country with a lot of desert, uh, a lot of sun, certainly you will look for maybe uh, solar panel solutions today. Uh, if you are in a windy area, you will look so maybe for wind farms. Huh? Uh, and those solutions are available today. Uh, but if we go back uh, maybe 15 years, 20 years ago, uh, solar wind farms were not uh, available or were very expensive uh, to provide uh, energy access to remote areas. And the solutions that were implemented at that moment in Chile, in many areas, in many small isles, islands in the south, was to give to the population uh, a, a power generator, a combustion power generator. Uh, that worked okay, but was a disaster at the end because uh, you give to these people a power generator, they need diesel or gas to run these power generators, and uh, that happened and at the time, if we are talking about uh, the early, late 2000s, that happened at a time where the price of oil went up to $140 per barrel. And that is $140 per barrel in the international market. But if you are in a very isolated island in the south of Chile, the price that they pay for one liter of gasoline was crazy. So at the end, was a very bad solution. But for good, we have these new, te new technologies that came out to, uh, today and allow us to change uh, the kind of uh, solution that you can provide to, to these families. So uh, to some extent, the, the need uh, of uh, some more affordable energy solution for isolated areas uh, went hand in hand with environmental constraint. Pedro? Uh, just I would like to add to this, uh, to this part. The, in terms of uh, energy consumption, these uh, rural areas, the, uh, when they are connected to the grid, the consumption is not so high. However, the, obviously the, the climate change uh, angle of, uh, of the power sector requires some specific attention. In the case of Peru, for instance, by 2008, the share of uh, natural gas or thermal power and hydropower and other renewables were more or less 50-50, uh, uh, or even the, uh, the thermal power was growing faster because of the natural gas. And as a result of the policies, we definitely applied, you know, because it was not the market which was willing to do that. It was some direct policies applied. And today, uh, hydropower plus the renewables is 60% of the share. And, and the uh, natural gas is providing 40. But in, even though those decisions are uh, uh, difficult to make, because it was cheaper to do the just thermal. But by doing, by, uh, doing hydro, uh, we were facing, oh, we were addressing a long-term uh, climate uh, change issues and, and starting to do those other technologies like wind and power, 
uh, having that um, uh, such a uh, amount of, re uh, of uh, resources uh, it was uh, cr uh, critical to start all those, uh, 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 make those decisions. Yeah, I mean, if I could just add, I mean, Latin America is actually uh, blessed with a lot of uh, potential renewable sources. So on the one hand, you have a lot of potential hydro. Uh, there are also discussions about exporting hydro from Peru, I guess, to, to Brazil, which is actually part of the Ober dress, Ober, the, the corruption issues that emerged in, in Peru. And uh, Chile is, uh, has a major amount of untapped, uh, I guess, solar in particular, as well as, well as wind. Um, there was a question over here, I think. Let me add a comment. So, uh, yeah. One more comment. The, the solutions uh, that will work in Peru uh, in, uh, might be different to the ones that work in Chile or some other countries. Uh, you have to think that Chile uh, doesn't have oil, doesn't have gas, doesn't have coal. Okay, So we import uh, about 95% uh, of the fossil fuels that we consume. Uh, a situation that is very different with other Latin American countries. Uh, uh, Peru has uh, a lot of gas, uh, has, has more oil than Chile. Uh, uh, so for us, uh, this technology breakthroughs that came with the renewable revolution was a bless uh, uh, because we were very poor in terms of uh, energy sources of the 20th century, but we had a huge potential to uh, develop the energy sources of the 21st century. Hi, my name is Antonia. Uh, my name is Antonia. I am a CIPA alumni and I work at the Earth Institute. Um, so my question is, how do you think Peru and Chile have performed in attempting to reduce the carbon intensity of the economies as we attempt to become developed countries? Um, and what do you think are the policy successes and challenges to continue reducing carbon intensity as our commitments should increase in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Pedro? Yes. <laughs> no, yes, both. Well, that's, yes, both. <laughs> that's, yes, uh, both, right? <laughs> okay. Sorry, that's, don't get uh, off. <laughs> It has been a big concern, I would say, from the late uh, 2000, early 2010 decade. Uh, when I was in the government, we launched the carbon intensity measure of uh, the power sector. We start measuring uh, emissions of CO2 per kilowatt hour uh, uh, in, in a project with the support of the World Bank. Uh, uh, so it's something that is, has been of increasing concern. If you look at uh, the power generator sector, in general, carbon intensity is coming down. If you look at uh, transportation sector, also carbon intensity is coming down uh, because there is today a tax on CO2 emission for cars. Uh, uh, and also because uh, the you keep moving the regulation of uh, the car fleet to newer standards, okay? Uh, so you have the European standard four, five, six, and you are introducing these new technologies uh, that uh, certainly uh, make cars much more fuel efficient, and with that you are reducing CO2 emissions per kilometer. Uh, so that is, I think, uh, something that is going on. Uh, also, the government has committed uh, to uh, uh, to have a, a CO2 neutral economy by 2050, and also has committed to uh, phase out all coal power plants in 2040. Uh, and that is a big hit, uh, because uh, you have coal power plants that were uh, just inaugurated a couple of months ago. Today there is no more coal power plant at the construction and no additional uh, license will be given to coal power plants. But there are people that invested recently in new coal power plants with very efficient technologies and maybe those, those coal power plants uh, will be phased out before 2040. Okay, so, so that is uh, how the government is moving to a clean economy. Uh, in the power sector in Peru, as I explained before, it's basically a clean, uh, one of the cleanest matrix of energy because the, uh, even natural gas is a good one compared with uh, any other choices. We used to have something like 5% uh, of the matrix uh, supplied by coal plants, 
which are being stopped now. So today we have the natural gas. So probably the, the other interesting piece is the fact that uh, the transport sector. We move from very uh, polluted uh, fuels to natural gas as well. The, uh, the main uh, uh, fuel for the transport sector in, in Lima and some other uh, uh, cities which already have the, power, the natural gas supply has moved to natural gas. And by doing, just by doing that, there's a substantial reduction of emissions. So the, uh, in case of Peru, we are still committed, uh, according to the COP20, uh, to those targets, which are quite uh, substantial. And I think, in, in general, those policies are moving on that direction. So if I could just make an observation. Um, as I said, so I run the, the research initiative at, at CGEP on the issue of energy and development. What's always striking to me um, is when we have discussions about energy and development, um, people tend to ask about access. People tend to ask about, your second question was sort of climate change adaptation, and your question was, the third question is about climate change mitigation. But when you actually look at the amount of energy that's actually being produced, consumed, used in these societies, it's not about access and it's not about climate change. I mean, there's a climate change um, overhang that's affecting it, but the fundamental challenges that I think you saw reflected actually in the presentations was as much as they talked a little about climate change for both countries, most of the challenges they discussed were not about access and were not about climate change. And so what tends to happen, I find, is there's often a disconnect. And I say that not so much only because of the discussions here at Columbia, but when I was previously at the World Bank and previously I worked at the International Energy Agency, you have this interesting dynamic, this disconnect between what happens when you have public discussions and what really most of the ministers tend to be spending their time thinking about, which a lot of times is that fossil fuels, getting that stuff to people, figuring out do you basically remove some of the subsidies on transport because you're going to have people riding or and the like, rather than issues about the cops that they're going to be organizing. I just, I just wanted to make that as an, as an observation because I think that's one reason also I wanted to make sure we discussed whether we would structure this with simply by having questions. And I asked both of them to do presentations because I felt it was important for them to sort of convey from their perspective what were some of the drivers that they had to face. And a lot of time it wasn't about the type of things that in some ways we would, are more interested in talking about in terms of the Q&A. Uh, we have time for one more question uh, and then I'll wrap it up. Let me make a comment on your Sure, he, he's, he's going to yeah. disagree with yeah. me, that's fine. No, 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 <laughs> Go ahead. No, uh, no, I don't want to disagree with you what can. you said. It's, 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 yeah, energy for development, yes, we need energy for the people. Huh? And that's why we care about energy access, uh, energy poverty. Huh? But uh, most, if you look, most of the energy consumption is uh, for the industrial sector, is for transportation, uh, is for, for working the economy, uh, having the economy to function well. Huh? Uh, and there is key to have uh, very, uh, competitive energy sources because if you have expensive energy sources your industries will not be able to compete on international markets so the key challenge for example in the case of Chile that has a lot of copper we produce one-third of the copper that is consumed in the world uh, uh, we are facing increasing competition for the copper sector in Peru that has uh, cheaper energy sources than we have in Chile, uh, certainly there's a big challenge in terms of how you can uh, build new energy sources that are cheaper, cleaner, and uh, keep your industry competitive on international markets. Uh, because without cheap energy, you are dead. You are dead. Last question. We don't have a lot of time, so maybe just a quick question, and then we'll have, then we'll have quick answers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm an emerging tech uh, infrastructure builder, an investor, and I think part of the disconnect, um, there's a lot of disconnects in the world, and I think a part of the disconnect is that oftentimes energy, climate, everything is spoken about in silos, but I think really what we're lacking is an infrastructure for the 21st century, right? AI is infrastructure, um, data is infrastructure, 
energy is infrastructure, and they're all interconnected. And I don't think there's enough conversation around the interdependencies and working to build the infrastructures to make those interdependencies work well. And I think partly, um, among other <laughs> things, it's a, it's a political will problem. So given that you, got, you both worked in politics and in government, I wonder if there, you could talk about what you think would help officials, po uh, politi politicians and officials start to really focus on our infrastructure needs. 45 second answers. No, what you need is uh, between government officials is uh, to have uh, dialogue coordination within them. Actually, because uh, in Chile you have a mining minister and you have an energy minister. And energy is key for the mining sector. Uh, uh, and you need to both ministers to work hand in hand in terms of the energy needs of the. Yeah, yeah, no, the best way, well, what we have in Chile is a, a couple of councils, one that depends from the finance minister and the other depends from the economic minister. Uh, both are led by them uh, because then you have the sectorial minister, energy, transportation, uh, agriculture. Uh, so the finance minister lead the development council. Uh, so all the ministers participate or the economic minister participate in the development council and we have a dialogue to coordinate and understand the needs of each <coughs> other in terms of what have to be coordinated to provide the support that the country needs. Pedro, real quick and then we're going to yeah. have one I more question. The, I think the infra, uh, this uh, infrastructure perspective is a good one because there is always economies of scale. I was just in Brazil two weeks ago talking about, for instance, which is best for them to, it's expanding gas or expanding electricity. And by uh, analyzing both in, uh, as a single uh, set of analysis, it's the, the best. So in countries, probably uh, having all those agencies uh, implementing not only sectoral government, uh, we have in Peru an agency uh, which is in charge of developing investment project, which is, uh, involves the, all the sectors. And so this dialogue you're asking about happens in that committee of ministers. One last question, real fast. Yeah. Go ahead. Or no, we'll bring you the mic. Go ahead. Just present yourself, too, and go ahead. Yes. My name is Alan Blanchard. I'm a senior analyst at an uh, energy storage company in New York City. Uh, so my question is, um, I've kind of had some discussions with um, energy access folks, and a lot of it comes, the, or the re deeming theme has been trust being an issue. And when you mentioned the whole thing about siphoning energy, there's technical solutions I have in my head. We can talk after about what I have for that. But in terms of p policy, if you ha could go back in time and implement a policy that would potentially fix that, what would it be n n seeing everything that you've seen to date? Okay, so enhancing trust. Real quick. You think regarding the situation that Chile is going on today? Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a distrust of the civil society in government authorities. Uh, it's a distrust in civil society in the policies. Uh, if you ask me to make an effort to build a better country, uh, so I, I will put back uh, my demands uh, to support your idea. Uh, and at the same time, or day after I see you, uh, with very bad practices that make people very crazy in Chile. They said, well, they ask us for to do efforts to support the government, but at the same time we see <coughs> politicians that have been involved in corruption and the solutions that have been uh, achieved for those politicians is that they have to take uh, ethical courses. And you say, oh my God. Huh? Uh, so the, 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 the issue, I think, is to build trust, uh, and the trust uh, goes with the example. Uh, uh, so you need politicians that you really trust what they are they doing, what they are saying. Uh, uh, so you need, I would say, new people, uh, new faces, uh, uh, and that is, to some extent, what uh, President Piñera has tried to do in uh, his recent uh, change of cabinet to bring people with new faces that uh, is not 
contaminated uh, with uh, any bad practice or is not related to issues that happened in the past uh, with Pinochet or whatever happened. And so I think that is very important. Pedro, just real quickly. Uh, probably the, uh, we work a lot in transparency and probably uh, it's uh, that the area I think needs to be reinforced, communicate more whatever you are doing. Even uh, with this uh, experience of the corruption happening with, the, uh, with Odebrecht or La Vallato thing, uh, one of the sectors which was less affected, uh, in fact, there was no project, uh, uh, and despite the fact that all this amount of contract we awarded during that time, there was no one involved in the, the energy sector. So, uh, but uh, because we were quite uh, uh, committed to make the things very transparent, very open. I think that's uh, something that could help. Yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm glad I gave the chance for that last question because, in fact, trust is very important and you find that people tend to pay their bill more or more likely to pay their bill if they have a better relationship, they have a more trusting relationship with their utility. We often focus too much on technical issues or policy issues when it comes down to issues like trust. Uh, so, having said all that, uh, thank you very much for all attending. Again, I apologize for the technical glitches we had and that's one reason I felt a little more comfortable going over over the time, even though I know my colleagues will be upset with me. But anyhow, so thank you again for joining us. And as I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. Uh, this is one of a number of great events we are hosting in the coming weeks. Our next event will be held Monday. It will also be live streamed for those of you unable to attend in person. And it's about how can nature fast track the recovery of our planet. It'll be held at the Princeton Club of New York on November 4th from 9.30 to 11. And we ask also a very distinguished panel there, including Ruth DeFries, who's a professor here at Columbia, and Dick Forrester, who's president of the International Emissions Trading Associations, and others. So what, if you'd all join me in uh, thanking our two uh, ministers for their very interesting insights.